Oral questions. Questions orales. L'honorable député de... The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Two months ago to the day here in the House, the Prime Minister stood up and puffed up his chest and said, we deliver. We are delivering vaccines. That was two months ago, Madam Speaker. Today, Canada is ranked 34th, and we're constantly dropping in the rankings. The Economist, which is a prestigious publication, says that most Canadians won't be, the vaccinations won't be completed until June 2022. The Honourable Minister. Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. And as he knows full well, Canada has negotiated with seven vaccine manufacturers, five of which have had very good results. Two have already been approved, and we're expecting more. And we'll be receiving doses this week, and we'll receive six million by the end of March. And all Canadians wishing to get vaccinated will be able to do so by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Madam Speaker, is the problem that for almost 10 days now we haven't received any vaccines. And The Economist is no lightweight. They say it won't be before June 2022 when the vaccinations will be completed. In Canada, less than 3 percent of people have been vaccinated, and in England, it's 15.5 percent. England and Canada were in the same boat, but the difference is that the Liberals went with a Chinese company that left Canada in the lurch. Why hasn't Canada ensured vaccine deliveries every day? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Parliamentary Secretary, rather. Madam Speaker, this government has been keenly aware of the urgency to get vaccines to all Canadians. We have entered into deals with Moderna and Pfizer, the two first vaccines to have been approved, and we will be, from those two providers alone, we will get enough vaccines by the end of September to vaccinate the entire Canadian population. Now, we have three other vaccines coming down the pipeline. We're awaiting approval. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Madam Speaker, what was urgent for the government 10 months ago was to enter into a deal with China, and that gave us nothing. And that is why today we still need vaccines. Yesterday, the premiers called on the Prime Minister for transparency. They wanted access to all the documents, the deals with the pharmaceutical developers. Why will the government not release those procurement contracts so we can find out why, for 10 days, the supply has run dry? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, transparency and responsibility, accountability are of prime importance to this government. We will provide the most information, as much information as possible. We have been doing that all through the pandemic, and we have cooperated with the provinces and territories, of course. But given the global competition, fierce competition for vaccines, revealing certain contractual information about specific uh, suppliers could jeopardize our vaccine supply. They could jeopardize our supply chain. We will continue. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Today is not a day for statistics. It's a human tragedy. We have 213,000 families who've lost their paycheck. That's the number of jobs lost. In the U.S., they've added 50,000 new jobs. Our unemployment rate is the highest in the G7, higher than the EU, higher than the UK, higher than the US, and the higher than the average of advanced economies.
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, with respect to the job numbers, I would point out to the member opposite that there is a global pandemic that is impacting different parts of the country and different parts of the world. I noticed that the recent job losses were concentrated in provinces that have been hit very hard by the second wave. The good news is projections from private sector economists continue to suggest that this will be an excellent year for economic growth with a projected average at 4.4% growth in GDP. What's important is during this time of need, the federal government is going to continue to be there for Canadian households and businesses, no matter what it takes, no matter how long it takes. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The Member's right. It is a global pandemic. It exists in the United States, which has significantly lower unemployment and added 50,000 jobs last month. It exists in the uh, UK, in Japan, in Germany, across the G G G7. It exists across the advanced economies, but every single jurisdiction I've just named has lower unemployment than Canada. We have now lost 213,000 jobs in just one month while the rest of the world is returning to work. Why do foreign workers get paychecks and we get credit card debts? Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, the short-sightedness of the member opposite is absolutely astounding. With great respect, if we wanted to have a short-term uptick in employment rates, we could talk to the Premiers and say, don't put in place public health measures that are designed to protect the lives and well-being of the people who live in our communities. But we know that that short-term game would do immeasurable damage to the long-term economic interests of our nation. We are going to advance supports so provinces can do what is right to protect the health and well-being of their residents, and we can prevent economic scar so we can rebound from this pandemic on the back end stronger than any developed economy in the world. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker, history will remember yesterday as the day everyone realized Canada had failed to secure vac vaccines on time. That means the pandemic will last a bit longer here than in other places. The government needs to get into solutions mode. The first step is to admit there's a problem. The government has to admit they fell down on the job. They have to start by coming clean with the public. When are they going to release the procurement contracts and a new, more credible vaccination timetable? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, we are in regular discussions with all provinces and territories. We're talking about vaccine deliveries that continue to arrive from Europe. We've entered into deals with seven manufacturers. Two are currently supplying vaccines to Canada. As the member knows full well, we will receive six million doses in Q1, and we will have enough vaccines from the approved suppliers to vaccinate everyone by the end of September. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. No, I don't know that full well because I don't have the calendar. Mr. Speaker, the government, Madam Speaker, rather, the government has to acknowledge its failure. Denial is pointless. They have to immediately tighten up border controls to prevent the spread of the virus. They have to boost health transfers because of the extended state of emergency in our hospitals. They have to boost pensions for seniors whose physical, mental, and financial health are at risk. They have to financially support seasonal industries, arts, tourism, hotels and fisher, fisheries. They have to negotiate to get vaccines produced in the U.S. When are they going to get into solutions mode? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madame, Madame Madam Speaker, the Bloc would like Canada to fail. They would like us not to succeed. But unfortunately for the Bloc, we are there for all Quebecers and all Canadians. We have deals with most vaccine producers. We were there for those who lost their jobs through the CERB. We've been there for our small and medium-sized businesses to help them get through this with the wage subsidy. We will continue to be there for our seniors. Madam Speaker, I know the Bloc would really like to see us fail, but it won't happen. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Madam Speaker, our seniors built our society, and we're lucky to have, to have them. Unfortunately, the pandemic has shown that conservative and liberal cuts to health have undermined our health care system. Seniors have been left to fend for themselves. 
staff are exhausted and their working conditions are terrible. It's a national shame and our seniors deserve better. They deserve to grow old in security and safety and dignity. Will the Liberals respond to our request to work with the provinces to guarantee the quality of care for seniors? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, thank my colleague for the question. We are there for seniors, and we have been there since the beginning of the pandemic. We have made sure that we provided financial support through one-time tax-free payments. We uh, made sure that we put additional money into uh, the community so that we could have community supports there to help seniors through this terrible time. And we are making sure that we are there supporting with additional financial uh, funding for health care support and in the long-term care sector. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. The COVID pandemic has shown Canadians the cost of government inaction and neglect. Families have suffered devastating losses of loved ones in long-term care centers across the country. But instead of fixing the problems like they promised, the Liberals continue to underfund health care and protect the profits of big corporations and their wealthy shareholders. Mr. Speaker, nobody should be profiting off the care of our seniors. Will the minister commit to improving Canada's long-term care system now so that residents, their families and long-term care workers no longer have to suffer? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank my Honourable uh, colleague for the question. Madam Speaker, regardless of where they live, those living in long-term care deserve quality care and to be treated with dignity. All providers need to be accountable for protecting those in long-term care. We need to protect those living and working in long-term care. And let me be clear, no one is invincible to this virus. We will continue working closely with provinces and territories to control and prevent infections in these facilities. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Nose Hill. Madam Speaker, yesterday the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Procurement said that the Liberals chose, quote, the second best vaccine procurement strategy for Canadians. I'd argue that's a bit of an understatement given that we're two million doses short this week. People are dying. We, we need a path forward. I want the best for Canadians. I want a path to recovery. Why did the Liberals knowingly settle for second best when Canadians deserve far better? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, of course, Canada has uh, done uh, exemplary work in this pandemic, including getting billions of pieces of PPE to, pe to uh, provinces and territories, including collaborating on uh, rapid testing with provinces, including procuring se from seven vaccine manufacturers enough doses to vaccinate every Canadian many times over. Just in the vaccines that we have uh, already approved, we have enough doses to vaccinate every Canadian who wishes to have one by the end of September and six million. Well, just to correct my colleague, zero doses arrived this week. Um, and, and Canadians shouldn't have to settle for second best. I mean, a year into the pandemic, tools like vaccines, rapid tests, therapeutics are being delivered around the world. And today, international outlets are reporting that 75% of a population receiving two doses of a vaccine would be a benchmark for a country achieving herd immunity. When will the government tell Canadians how many need to be vaccinated before unprecedented restrictions the federal Liberals have imposed will be lifted? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, and we have taken action for Canadians throughout this crisis. Again, we've said this in the House many times. We've highlight, we, we've secured the highest numbers of doses per capita of any country in the world with the most diverse portfolio of COVID-19 vaccines. Vaccines are in Canada with more shipments and deliveries confirmed through February and March and ramping up through the spring. We're working the provinces and territories to support them in their responsibilities to deliver vaccines so that every Canadian can get vaccinated when they wish. The Honourable Deputy de Mégantic L'Érable. The Honourable Member for Mégantic L'Érable. Of G7 countries, Canada has spent the most. The deficit could reach $400 billion this year. Canadians are among the least vaccinated in the world, behind the U.S., the U.K., 
Italy, and Finland. Despite the ast astronomical spending, the results are pitiful. No vaccines, no recovery, no jobs. Why is this Prime Minister always coming in last? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. That the Honourable Member would suggest that Canada has spent more to be there for businesses and households as a bad thing. We knew at the beginning of this pandemic that we had the choice to either let households and businesses bear the cost of the economic shutdowns associated with COVID-19 or to be there so we could ensure that families could keep a roof over their head, food on the table, and businesses could keep their workers on the payroll. Mr. Speaker, if I had the opportunity time and time again, I would choose to be there for Canadians, and I'm disappointed to see that the Conservatives would choose not the Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. It's a simple question. Why won't the Prime Minister come clean on vaccine supply? Why keep our companies in the dark and force workers to stay home? Without vaccines, no jobs, small businesses will have to close up shop. Is it too much to ask the Prime Minister for a bit of honesty and less talk, less rhetoric, that's no, less prepared lines? Canadians who don't have jobs deserve to know what's going on. Will the Prime Minister admit that his plan isn't working and tell us the whole truth, please? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, it is difficult to take lessons about prepared lines from a member who seems content to read his question off a paper in front of him in the chamber. It is not a prepared line that we stepped up to be there for now 9 million Canadians with CERB. It is not a prepared line that 4.5 million workers still have their jobs because of the wage subsidy. It is not a prepared line that 800,000 businesses have had the emergency business account to help them keep their doors open. With great respect to my friend and colleague opposite, we know that this COVID-19 pandemic comes with an immense cost. The difference between our parties is we knew that the government had a duty to be there for Canadians and business, households and businesses. Edmonton Centre. Madam Speaker, not even a month in, President Joe Biden has stated that his administration considers the Chinese telecom giant Huawei to be a national security threat. Now, six years into his role, the Prime Minister has yet to make a decision on Huawei. Will the Prime Minister stand with our international allies and say no to Huawei? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And our government is going to continue to ensure that Canadian networks are kept safe and secure. We're never going to comment on specific companies. And everyone knows that an examination of 5G technologies and review of security and economic considerations is well underway. We're going to carefully weigh these matters with our allies, with our partners, including with the Biden administration. And we're going to make the best decision for Canadians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Centre. Madam Speaker, well, that's just not good enough. Canada is the only allied Five Eyes country without a formal policy to ban or restrict Huawei from operating in Canada. And now it looks like our neighbours down south are ready to make a strong decision on this matter. Why is the government choosing to stand with a company connected to the Chinese government rather than our long-held, strong international allies? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it, it is clear that our government recognizes the importance of protecting Canada's telecommunications systems. We're regularly engaging with telecommunications companies, with our allies, with the security infrastructure on a variety of topics just like this. We're not going to publicly discuss advice given by our national security experts, but I can assure you that we're always going to be taking the steps necessary to protect Canadians. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Madam Speaker, the federal government has failed to secure vaccines to Quebec on a timely basis. That means the pandemic will last longer here than it should. That's bad news for everyone, especially seniors. They're the ones who would be vac vaccinated uh, would be vaccinated today, but Quebec has had to slow down its campaign in seniors' homes because there are no vaccines to give people shots with. What is the government doing now to ensure that we get vaccines now and not in six months for our seniors? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, the Government of Canada signed seven very sound deals with the interpreter. Can't interpret. There are two people speaking at the same time. We will be receiving six million doses by the end of Q1. And from approved suppliers, we'll, we'll get enough to vaccinate everyone, all Canadians, by the end of September. Now, I'll member for Shefford. 
Madam Speaker, we're anxious to see the timetable and the plan because the extension of the pandemic for seniors means that they'll, they've already been under lockdown for 11 months without seeing their loved ones. Their physical health is obviously jeopardized. Their mental health declines with isolation and their financial health because they're among the people who have the, less, the least federal support, even though they're the most hard hit by COVID. The paltry amount the government has provided them in benefits so far is not enough. Will they, on an ongoing basis, increase pensions for those 65 and older by $110 a month? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We, Madam Speaker, we deeply care about our seniors who built our society and who are now in homes and long-term care all across Quebec and Canada. We're delighted that they have been the priority for vaccination campaigns. Many of them have already been vaccinated and more vaccines are to come shortly and there will be enough vaccines to vaccinate all seniors and Quebecers by the end of September. Full member for Foothills. Yesterday, McKinsey Consulting agreed to pay nearly $600 million U.S. for its role in fueling the opioid crisis in the United States. For almost a decade, that firm was led by Dominic Barton, the Prime Minister's hand-picked ambassador to China. During that time, McKinsey was advising opioid companies to pay rebates for drug overdoses just to boost the sales of OxyContin. Before naming him to key positions in the Liberal government, was the Prime Minister informed of Mr. Barton's role at McKinsey and the firm's involvement in the opioid crisis? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the uh, Honourable Member for the question. And as I have said before in the House, Ambassador Barton's role is first and foremost about defending Canadian people's interests and values in China. That includes securing the release of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. That includes being uh, active on every file that is of interest to Canadians in China. Canadians can be proud of the immense amount of effort the Ambassador has devoted to all of these objectives. Upon his nomination, Ambassador Barton worked directly with the Ethics Commissioner to set up an ethics screen, and we can continue to be proud of his work in China for Canadians. Member for Foothills. It is incredible that the Liberals are defending Dominic Barton and refusing to answer this question. Is it because McKinsey pled guilty to criminal charges for its role in the opioid crisis, a crisis which has claimed the lives of more than 16,000 Canadians? Is it because the provinces have now filed civil lawsuits against the opioid companies that McKinsey advised? Again, yes or no? Don't be afraid to answer this question. Did the Prime Minister have prior knowledge of Mr. Barton's role at McKinsey and the firm's involvement in the opioid crisis? Elementary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I think with all Canadians, everyone in this House knows about the opioid crisis, which is gripping many parts of our country and causing great turmoil, stress and death. And we still feel the impacts of Purdue's role, Purdue's role in creating the opioid crisis. We're not denying that. This crisis has been felt across our country. Too many communities are impacted. Too many loved ones are left behind. The world wants answers, the world needs answers, and should get answers. But while we wait, we will continue to do our part to ensure the health of all Canadians. Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Many Canadians who are out of a job turn to this government for help. Unfortunately, the government is letting them down. People who have been denied employment insurance have applied directly for CR have been directed to apply for CRB. However, due to a technical issue with the CRA's pay system, they were automatically denied. Can the minister please confirm on what day this ridiculous issue will be resolved? Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I can assure the member and everyone in this House that we are making every effort to get this resolved as soon as possible. Understandably, we want to make sure people aren't getting two, two benefits at the same time, but at the same time, people need to get the benefits that they're entitled to. We're working on this. I can't give the member a date because um, right now we're just all hands on deck trying to solve this, and I will get back to him with further information. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Essex. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Revenue. <clears throat> This government has left parents in my riding in a catch-22. Home with their children, they applied for EI. Their claim was denied. Advised to apply for the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit, that application was, already den was also denied. But get this, due to an open EI claim, proof has been provided to CRA, but their database is not able to bypass the error. 
No more platitudes, no more backpassing. When can these parents expect this desperately needed income support? Honourable Minister. Uh, Madam Speaker, I can assure the member that CRA and ESDC through Service Canada are working to resolve these issues where people have two different claims in the system. As I said, from an integrity point of view, we want to make sure people aren't getting paid twice. Um, but that small comfort I know to citizens who are waiting for their payments, we're working very hard to resolve this. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. A 78-year-old woman was fatally injured in a home invasion. The suspect was found at the homeless encampment at Strathcona Park. As the homelessness crisis continues, safety concerns for the campers and residents have escalated to a breaking point. Emergency action is needed to house the campers to end this dire situation. The province has requested 50-50 cost sharing with the federal government to acquire distressed housing or motels as an emergency pandemic measure. It's been over nine months, still no answer. Will the federal government take immediate action and partner with the province to end this homelessness crisis. Well, Parliamentary Secretary. M Madam Speaker, uh, we have prioritized uh, investments in the most vulnerable Canadians, including those who are homeless or experiencing uh, or are at risk of experiencing homelessness. Early during the pandemic, we invested 157 point five million dollars to ensure additional dollars. We've also launched the Rapid Housing Initiative in which uh, the city of Vancouver and the province of British Columbia will get significant funding to build rapid housing to find permanent solutions to the most vulnerable so that they cannot be on the street and actually have affordable housing options. Honorable member for Cowichan, Malahat Langford. Madam Speaker, freighter anchorages around southern Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands were established on traditional and unceded territories without the consent of local First Nations. The area is also being proposed as a national marine conservation area, recognizing its vital marine ecosystem and precious coastal environment. Liberals often like to say that no relationship is more important than that with Indigenous peoples and that they genuinely care about our environment. When will the Minister of Transport honour these commitments and put a stop to the Port of Vancouver using our waters as an overflow industrial parking lot? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, the government's long-term strategy regarding anchorages is aimed at three things. Improving the management of anchorages outside of public ports, ensuring the long-term efficient and reliability of the supply chain, and lastly, mitigating environmental and social impacts. The new interim protocols for anchorages was developed in partnership with the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, with the Pacific P Pilotage Authority, and local communities. In fact, the new protocol was instituted to respond to the immediate concerns of those coastal communities. I can assure the Honourable Member that the well-being of coastal communities is of The Honourable Member for Pierre Fondolard. Madam Speaker, hatred and extremism often target diverse communities. We must stop anyone who seeks to harm others because of their race, religion, or gender. Unfortunately, we continue to see hate manifest in our country. Recently, a Montreal synagogue was vandalized. In my home province of Quebec, we just marked the fourth anniversary of the Quebec City mosque attack. These, event, these events remind us of the painful impacts hate can have. Can the Minister of Public Safety let this house know what new measures our government is taking to protect people from extremist violence and hate? Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to begin by thanking the Honourable Member from Pierre Fondelard for his very important question and for his excellent work in standing up to hate and intolerance. Madam Speaker, the listing of terrorist entities is an important legal tool in the fight against terrorism, which makes it clear that Canada will not tolerate such acts of violence. To be listed, an individual or group must meet a strict legal threshold determined by our national security agencies. This week, we added 13 new groups to the list, which includes four ideologically motivated violent extremist and white supremacist organizations, in addition to the two that were listed for the first time in 2019. Madam Speaker, we will remain vigilant against all of all. The Honorable Member for Medicine Hat Cardston. Thank you, uh, Speaker. The Canadian Statistics Advisory Council says this Liberal government doesn't have the data required to make the decisions on the pandemic. This is the type of data needed to support public policy decisions that are being made now. Canadians can't trust government decisions when that government doesn't have or won't show what they know, or maybe more accurately, what they don't know. This government has gone from saying they have Canadians' backs to hiding things behind their backs. 
When will the government provide Canadians with this data and share their plan for recovery? Uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Sorry, Madam Speaker, my mic was not on. In order for Canadians to benefit from, uh, from the digital economy, we're going to need to ensure that Canadians have confidence that their data is safe and that they trust their privacy is being respected. And that is exactly why our government is strengthening that trust by ensuring that Canada has a world-leading privacy and data protection system and the companies that break the rules face severe consequences. I, the Honourable Member for Medicine Hat. Cardston is advising uh, the speaker that that is not an answer to the question asked. Uh, uh, would you? Oh, it was. Uh, could you repeat the question? Absolutely. Thank you very much. The Canada Statistics Advisory Council says that the Liberal government doesn't have the data required to make decisions on this pandemic. This is the type of data needed to support public policy decisions that they are making right now. Canadians can't trust government decisions when that government doesn't have or won't show what they know, or worse yet, what they don't know. This government has gone from saying they have Canadians' backs to hiding information behind their backs. When will this government provide Canadians with data and share what their recovery plan really is? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House. Madam Speaker, from the beginning of this pandemic, the Government of Canada has relied upon the opinions of experts to guide all of our decisions, whether it's in relation to procurement of vaccines, whether it's in relation to rebuilding our biomanufacturing capacity, whether it's in relation to the, uh, the, uh, the manufacturing of PPE. At every point of the way, we've been relying upon Canada's experts and making sure that the data upon which our decisions are made is solid. The Government of Canada shares as much data as possible, and we know that this is important because open science is important, and our government is going to continue to work, work with our experts and rely upon their opinions as we make our decisions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for leeds Grenville, Rido, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. Across the border and minutes away from my community, U.S. seniors are able to be vaccinated at their convenience. On our side of the border, we're locked down, uncertain about our health, unable to see our families, and many are uncertain about their livelihoods. Lockdowns were supposed to be a temporary measure to buy government's time, but this government has failed to widely deploy rapid tests and vaccines. Our allies are getting vaccines for their most vulnerable, saving lives and allowing lockdowns to end. When will these Liberals do the same? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, and I just want to correct the member and just give a few facts and figures here. 1.19 million vaccines have been sent to provinces and territories. The member speaks about rapid tests. Almost 19 million rapid tests have been sent to provinces and territories. 6.4 million to Ontario, 3.2 million to Quebec, 1.9 million to Alberta. Madam Speaker, we have delivered rapid tests and we are delivering vaccines. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable, uh, the Honourable, sorry, the Honourable Member for uh, Kildonan St. Paul. Manitoba is ramping up its plans to vaccinate 20,000 people per day by April. 13 vaccine super sites are opening up, as well as doctor's offices and local pharmacies, and all elderly and care homes have received their first dose. Provinces like Manitoba are doing their part to ensure vaccines are delivered to the people. But the province's efforts have been thwarted in part because the Prime Minister can't provide a reliable vaccine shipment schedule. The shipments aren't reliable thanks to poor vaccine contracts negotiated by this Liberal government. Madam Speaker, when are Manitobans getting our next vaccine shipment? and how many doses will we receive, we deserve to know. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, of course we communicate with provinces like the Members Province of Manitoba on a regular basis. We continue to receive vaccine shipments uh, and people in Manitoba would be receiving them as well. Uh, that includes this week. We have doses coming by the end of March, 6 million in fact, that have already been approved and enough to vaccinate every Canadian by the end of September. And we're glad that Manitoba and other provinces are ramping up their ability to vaccinate citizens because as more and more vaccine doses arrive, we will want those deployed as soon as possible. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. 
Madam Speaker, all Canadians should welcome the government's addition of 13 new groups to the criminal code terrorist list. But the Liberals once again have failed Canadians, failing to fully ban Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. The IRGC has sponsored terror around the world for decades and is responsible for the destruction of the Ukraine air flight last year that killed 55 Canadians and 30 permanent residents. Madam Speaker, when will the Liberal government finally list the most deadly terror organization in the world today? Honourable Minister. I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question and, and remind him that we are, are working with respect to that particular regime with all like-minded countries to ensure that Iran is held to account for their support of terrorism. I'd also remind him that the Canadian government has listed four of the proxy agencies of the IRCG, um, including the Quds Force. Uh, we will continue to work with our allies to address the the this activities of the Iranian government and the sponsorship of terrorism, taking all appropriate measures against that regime, and we will continue to use all of the legal tools available to us based on the advice of our national security intelligence officials. Thank you, Madam Honorable Deputy de Saint-Jean. The Honorable Member for Saint-Jean. Madam Speaker, permanent residents have found themselves in an inhumane situation because of the federal government's incompetence. The government gives families permanent residency and gives them a visa to come to Canada. These people leave their jobs, sell their homes, get on a plane, arrive in Canada, and then they're told by the border services, go back to your country. The Department of Immigration invites them. But once they're here, the Department of Public Safety wants to send them back. When will the two departments speak to each other and fix this unacceptable blundering? Yeah. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. In order to stop spread of COVID-19 and protect Canadians, we have created measures at the border. We have also implemented exceptions to encourage our economic recovery and reunite families. Anyone who has received a confirmation of permanent res residency after the implementation of new measures at the border will receive a letter confirming the situation. We will continue to protect all Canadians' health and safety. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Madam Speaker, they get a letter and a visa, but seemingly the left hand doesn't know what the right is doing in this government. You have a department inviting immigrants to come to Canada and another department which tries to get them to go away. In the same way that one department tells people to not travel and another one authorizing discount flights abroad. No one is talking to each other in this government. How come this government is so permissive with people who are violating its guidelines in order to travel abroad and so punitive with people who are following its own guidelines and arrive in Canada on invitation? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary, I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. We have been very clear. For Canadian safety and the safety of those arriving in Canada, this is not the time to travel. Border services agents can refuse entry to anyone who arrives at a port of entry and who doesn't satisfy the requirements. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lévis de Bignard. Madam Speaker, Canada gave money to an international organization to distribute vaccines to, uh, to developing countries. And now we're asking that same organization to give us vaccines from the same fund to compensate for this prime minister's failure. Madam Speaker, it's embarrassing, even shameful for us as proud Canadians. And that is why we want to cast light on the situation. When will this government make the vaccine procurement contracts public? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. If I may just correct the record that the COVAX facility was actually designed to have the buy-in of wealthy countries. It has two tracks, one for self-financing countries to purchase vaccines through COVAX, as well as to make donations. In fact, Canada, Canada has done both. We've contributed $220 million to provide vaccines for the developing world while also purchasing on behalf of Canadians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. Madam Speaker, the new American administration has stopped the Keystone XL pipeline dead in its tracks, killing thousands of jobs in Alberta. Now Michigan is attempting to shut down Enbridge Line 5, killing thousands of jobs in Ontario. This Liberal government has responded by rolling over and playing dead. 
All this while energy workers watch foreign oil come into Canada from third world dictators and human rights abusers. What specific action will this Liberal government take to reduce foreign oil imports into Canada this year? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We take this issue with respect to Line 5 very seriously. Line 5 is vital to our energy security. This line is critical uh, economic and energy security link between Canada and the U.S. It has safely operated for over 65 years. It provides good-paying middle-class jobs for the thousands of workers of refineries in Sarnia, Montreal, and Lévis, Quebec. I assure this House we are looking at all our options. Line 5 is a vital pipeline for Canada's energy security, and we fully support it. Merci, Madame la Présidente. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Shepherd. Calgary is home to proud entrepreneurs. Those risk takers created WestJet, and after the devastation of our energy sector by malicious liberal policy actions, it became our largest corporate headquarters. Now WestJet has gone from 14,000 workers to 5,700 due to a lack of support from this liberal government. Madam Speaker, what is this liberal government going to do to save and secure aviation and airline jobs? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Nothing. Madam Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member knows that NAV Canada is an independent organization that operates at an arm's length. Um, my heart goes out to all those who are affected by the current anxiety and uncertainty in this, uh, in this marketplace and under the pandemic. That's why our government has been committed to supporting all Canadians. And I can assure the Honourable Member that any decision NAVS makes that may have an impact on safety and security will be reviewed by Transport Canada. Thank you. The Honourable uh, Member for Longueuil, Charles Madam Speaker, since the beginning of the pandemic, many first-line workers throughout the country have seen a sharp increase in domestic violence due to women being isolated at home with their abuser, as well as other additional stress factors caused by the pandemic. On behalf of organizations in my riding, Longueuil Charlemagne, which help women who are victim of domestic violence, can the minister tell this house about the status of the National Action Plan Against Gender-Based Violence? Madame la Présidente, je tiens Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Longueuil Chalamon for this important question. Six million people benefit from the women's organizations our government supports, including 500 organizations we've supported with long-term funding and more than 1,000 we've supported through COVID-19. In Canada, sans violence... A Canada without gender-based violence is the Canada, is the Canada that, that we all want. At the beginning of this month, the minister joined her provincial and territorial counterparts to sign a historic declaration. Working the Honourable Member for Dufferin Calden. Mr. Speaker, 2020 was a terribly long year for Canadians, but especially for veterans. In response to my order paper question, Veterans Affairs is showing that 47% of disability applications are taking more than 27 weeks to process almost 30% are taking over a year. Mr. Speaker, for a veteran to wait uh, over a year in a pandemic is inexcusable. What does the minister have to say to veterans? Here's a hint, start with an apology. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I truly agree that veterans should not have to wait, and that's why we invested near $200 million to, to hire new staff to speed up the process to ensure veterans receive a faster decision. Veterans should receive their benefits and services they're entitled to in a timely manner, and as I've said many times, this backlog is unacceptable, and we are going to deal with it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Deputy de Montmagny-Lillet... The Honourable Member for Montmagny-Lillet, Kamouraska, rivière du loup Madam Speaker, the Montmagny RCM is concerned about cell coverage, which is not improving in the region. We're hearing a lot about 5G, but in places like Sainte lucie Beauregard, La Frontière, and saint fabien Pané, we don't even have 1G. And we're getting radio silence from the government, even though it, it managed to get $3.5 billion from the 600 megahertz spectrum auction. It is selling public airwaves. 
why is the government not ensuring that regional cell network development is not being sacrificed to the profit of big cities? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, our government is the one that has invested the greatest amount in high-speed internet in rural Canada. There is still a lot to be done, it's true. And that is why, in November, the Prime Minister announced a $1.75 billion investment to continue connecting Canadians. Rural Canadians deserve better coverage. We are working on that with the provinces and territories. And we will continue to invest in the months to come. This is very important. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Yellowhead. Madam Speaker, when the minister announced the results of the 600 megahertz auction last year, she noted that the government set-aside policy had created more competition for Canadians. But we now know that set-aside bidders have a poor track record of deploying spectrum in rural communities. There needs to be a use it or lose it condition to ensure spectrum is deployed in rural Canada. Madam Speaker, why won't the government force service providers to deploy spectrum in rural Canada so we can get high-speed internet? Well, Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, our government is doing taking every single measure in the policy toolbox to ensure that all sort that all sorts of investments and all sorts of new uh, infrastructure around telecommunications can get integrated across Canada. Spectrum auction is just one of these sets of policies, and we're working towards a new spectrum auction later on this year. There have been delays due to COVID-19, but we're well aware that this is a very important mechanism to ensure that Canadians have the very best of telecommunications infrastructure across Canada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coast of Bay Central, Notre Dame. Madam Speaker, as the Member of Parliament for Gander, we are proud of our great contributions to international aviation. In particular, the Gander Air Control Centre navigates air traffic in the North Atlantic for both domestic and international carriers. Now, before the pandemic, they safely guided 10 to 12,000 flights per week. Now, with reduced air traffic, most layoffs have been in Gander. We know that air traffic will someday return, but I worry we will lose too many air traffic controllers to even meet our international obligations. Can the minister please provide information about any discussions with NAV Canada? Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Let me start off by thanking my colleague for his question. And I know he's a strong voice for his region and for his constituents. Um, and also let me uh, join him in recognizing the talent and the skills that air traffic controllers and other skilled uh, aviation sector workers uh, that are enriching our country. He knows that NAV Canada is an independent organization that plays an important role for our aviation safety. I understand the anxiety that people are feeling today, uh, given the pandemic and the circumstances around it. And we will continue to be there for all Canadians who are negatively impacted by it. And and Bill member for North Island, Powell River. Madam Speaker, wild salmon are the backbone of the communities that I represent. The Minister's Discovery Island decision was announced in my writing with no plan in place, leaving a significant void for the communities that I serve. My office is hearing questions like, what is the plan to rebuild the wild salmon stocks? What is the plan to help workers and businesses in the region? And most importantly, when is the plan coming? Why did the Minister not have a transition plan, especially during a pandemic? Shouldn't that have been top of mind? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank my, honor my Honourable colleague for the question. Um, I also want to thank her for her advocacy and for continuing to reach out to myself, my team, um, and have these very important discussions. Madam Speaker, this is a twofold question. First of all, the decision to phase out fish farms in the Discover Islands was not an easy one to make, but it was made in consultation with the seven First Nations in that area who had real concerns around aquaculture in their territory. Um, Madam Speaker, we know that this has had impacts and we are looking at all ways that we can address these concerns. We are going to continue to work with the province of British Columbia, with the industry and with First Nations and the communities to make sure that we're doing everything we can to address those concerns. Madam Speaker, with regards to Member the... Member for Lennox, uh, Lennox, sorry, Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Canadians have been alarmed by news of travellers returning home only to be welcomed by unknown authorities who refuse to identify themselves and shuttle them into unmarked vehicles on pain of arrest. These officers are refusing to state their names, badge numbers, what organization they belong to, or even where they are forcibly taking Canadian citizens against their will. Does the minister feel this is an appropriate response to the quarantine order? And if not, what will the minister do about this abuse of Canadians' constitutional rights? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, and, and I would remind the member that our most effective measure that we put in place at the borders for protecting the health and safety of Canadians are our quarantine measures and ensuring that everyone who is directed and ordered into quarantine complies with those orders is an important element of our protecting Canadians. We are working very diligently with the, with the police of jurisdiction in every province and territory of this country to ensure that there is compliance with the, those orders. And of course, it's always the responsibility of those law enforcement officials to respect the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Madam Speaker, we have great confidence in our, in our police to do their jobs, and we support them in that effort. This um, marks the end of oral questions.